Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Erkin, and um, it's a pleasure to have you join us for our Friday morning virtual uh, thyroid journal club. It's really a pleasure for me to introduce uh, our two speakers this morning. Uh, Dr. Mario Salvi is an endocrinologist in Milan who has dedicated his career to thyroid autoimmunity. His major focus is on uh, Graves' disease and Graves' orbitopathy. In 2002, he formed and led the Graves' Orbitopathy Center in Milan, which has been recognized um, as a center of excellence. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Salvi has conducted a significant amount of clinical research um, with multi-gland center trials conducted as a member of the European Group on Graves' Orbitopathy. He is widely published with over 170 peer-reviewed publications and numerous chapters in um, dedicated to thyroid eye disease. Um, our discussant this morning um, is very familiar to um, this uh, journal club platform. Dr. Terry Davies is an internationally renowned clinician scientist, widely recognized for his expertise in autoimmune thyroid disease. He is the Florence and Theodore Baumritter Professor of Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Davies has long been funded by the NIH for his research in autoimmune thyroid disease and has published extensively with over 400 peer-reviewed papers. He's widely recognized as one of the leading experts in this field. Um, he is a past president of the American Thyroid Association and has received countless um, awards uh, during his uh, career. Um, the primer that we included as part of the reading materials on Graves' disease that um, I would uh, strongly encourage you to review that. It is really um, a, an outstanding contribution and um, uh, very worth uh, the time and effort to do so. So with that, I'm going to turn over the platform to Mario Salvi, and thank you once again, Dr. Salvi, for joining us this morning. Thank you, Mark, for, for the presentation, and thank you, Terry Davis, for being uh, here with us today. Um, I'm, I'm going to be reading the, the, the case presentation of today, and that is going to be the, 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 uh, and what we were working from to, to, to explain and, and to go through uh, the data that uh, will be presented later on. A 29-year-old man presented with a six-month history of palpitation, anxiety, and progressive weight loss. On physical examination, uh, a visible goiter was found. Consequently, lab tests were ordered and confirmed the diagnosis of hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease. The patient was started on methimazole, 30 milligrams a day, to treat the hyperthyroidism and he was also advised to undergo radioiodine ablative therapy as definite treatment. The patient tells you he's worried since he has read about the risk of developing de novo thyroid eye disease progression after radioiodine administration. At this moment, you explain that, that uh, radioiodine should be avoided since it will undoubtedly result in the development of thyroid eye disease. B, there is no risk of developing post radio iodine thyroid eye disease after a short course of oral steroids. C, there is no risk of developing thyroid eye disease post radio iodine after the short course of intravenous glucocorticoids. D, radioiodine should, should be postponed until after thyrotoxicosis has been controlled and the patient has ceased smoking.
Dr. Salvi, we are all set. Um, it looks like we've got uh, a fairly uh, um, a decent uh, um, set of responses in different directions okay. here, so hopefully we'll get some clarity um, okay. at the end. All right. As late as 2009, um, our group published a retrospective study in which we examined how important the problem of uh, uh, activation of raised orbitopathy was after administering radioactive iodine in patients, considering a group of patients with sub, uh, undergoing a steroid prophylaxis and a group of patients not undergoing steroid prophylaxis. And interestingly, what we saw in that uh, in that papers was, with the limitation of this study being retrospective, was that uh, the um, number of patients developing de novo orbitopathy or reactivating pre-existing orbitopathy was kind of uh, um, elevated and it was in line with what we uh, we observed that was observed in previous study interestingly enough though we uh, we did try to uh, analyze which were the factors that were in, in particularly uh, <clears throat> uh, associated with the activation of the eye disease and in a, in, in, a, in a group of, 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 of this patient, a group of patients, they, they were submitted to, ant, to steroid prophylaxis. Uh, we had the chance also to differentiate two groups, one undergoing oral steroid and the one undergoing intravenous steroids of comparable dosage. And what we uh, observed was a different, uh, a different uh, behavior. The patients activated in this retrospective study were 14.2%, uh, 40, so a, a fairly elevated proportion of these patients. And when we looked at the various factors involved in this reactivation, uh, we know that uh, some of the risk factors are well known. And we know that, for example, activation of eye disease is, is typically more frequent in patients who are smokers, in patients who may uh, have um, hi uh, hypothyroidism develop developing rapidly after radioiodine and not properly corrected, and also patients with recurrent hyperthyroidism in the past. We also um, studied, though, the duration of the thyroid disease, and we observed that there was a significant difference in the duration of thyroid disease and in the duration of the pre-existing orbitopathy in patients who had the eye disease that was associated with the activation. Mm -hmm. So, in, in especially, especially in this uh, relates to the, the fact that when we were administering IV steroids, we did not seem to see, to have, reactivation of the eye disease, whereas this was seen in about 45% of patients when they were submitted to oral steroids. So uh, this study um, was, was very interesting in our, in our hands, but we, uh, we knew that the limitation of being a retrospective study would have had to be uh, confirmed in a prospective study. This data in particular, the, 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 the point uh, of defining which, which factors may prevent, which factors have to be looked at to prevent the development of eye disease were to be studied in a, in a prospective matter. The point is this, I mean, uh, when we think about the possibility of preventing uh, um, thyroid eye disease with steroid, we, uh, the question, the big question that comes, that arises is, are we giving steroids to all patients with Graves' disease undergoing radioiodine? Are we selecting patients based on the risk factors? Which are the risk factors? These are the questions that we wanted to answer with this, with this prospective study. And in fact, what we did was to uh, study uh, three groups of patients. Uh, Group A has patients uh, who were uh, they were randomized to be treated with either 
intravenous, group A, or oral uh, steroids, or no prophylaxis. And these were the three groups of patients that we studied. And interestingly enough, uh, the only difference that were, or was observed in these patients because we chose to do that was based on the data on the, on the uh, retrospective study was that the duration of Graves' disease in the two patients randomized to get to, to receive steroids was uh, less than five years, uh, whereas patients who we decided to include in the study without submitting them to to uh, um, steroid prophylaxis <clears throat> had long-standing disease more than five years, based on what we had observed <clears throat> in the retrospective study. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, as you see here in this table, there were no significant differences except for the duration for all the other parameters. The uptake was not different. Uh, the, the, the levels of TSH receptor antibody was not different in, different in the three groups. And the, the, the prevalence of pre patients with pre existing orbitopathy in the th three groups was not different. So, and this is uh, interesting to see because uh, all the data existing in the literature so far are uh, um, really looking at patients treated with radio iodine and pre existing inactive GO. In this Dr. way, in this Dr. Dr. Yep. Sally, yeah, we're we're not seeing your screen. I apologize to interrupt here. Um, we're just oh. we're we're stuck on the case presentation. Okay, how come? I'm going to have to defer to one of my uh, technically savvy colleagues here. Hi, Dr. Salvi. I'm going to go ahead and send you a, a notification to share your screen again, and yeah. hopefully that should solve the issue. So you should get a notification. Okay. There we go. Okay, right, there we go. Are you seeing it now? Yes, we're yes. great. Thank you. Well, well, maybe I should go back at least to the last couple of slides then. I'm that would afraid. be great. Okay. All right. So as I say, um, uh, you, you, I was uh, referring to uh, what uh, the initial, how, how. We, we started off on this on this topic. Actually, the idea was to uh, find uh, which parameters, clinical parameters, may be used to predict activation or de novo uh, or de novo onset of thyroid eye disease when we um, submit the patient we uh, to radioactive iodine. And in a retrospective study that we conducted about 10 years ago, we uh, observed two things mostly that when we were considering the various risk factors that are known to um, make the patients more prone to develop this, uh, this complication, which, is, which in fact is smoking, uh, which, uh, which is uh, the, um, the fact of having a recurrent hyperthyroidism, the fact of having elevated serum TSH receptor antibodies, the fact of having also um, uh, uncontrolled hypothyroidism after the, after therapy, not promptly corrected. But we also included in this patient, we also studied the duration of disease. And what we found, it was surprisingly, <clears throat> that the, <clears throat> the difference, we found a difference in the duration of disease between patients who activated uh, ophthalmopathy and uh, versus patients who did not activate ophthalmopathy. And this was good, this was true for both the duration of grave disease and the duration of the ocular disease. So as you see in this slide, the mean duration of thyroid disease in patients with activation was uh, who activated the orbitopathy was uh, of uh, 20, 25, 26 months. Uh, for uh, for the duration for the eye disease, sorry for Graves' disease, and 12 to 18 months for the eye disease. So based on that, we uh, decided to uh, confirm this uh, this hypothesis, to study this hypothesis in a, in a prospective way to confirm this data, and we designed a study in which we planned to we uh, randomized patients to to um, uh, in, in th to uh, pay, uh, sorry, we uh, randomized patients with uh, uh, receiving 
either intravenous or oral steroids in, in patients whose disease duration was less than five years based on the data of the retrospective study and a group of 22 patients not undergoing radioactive iodine whose duration of disease was more than five years based on the data of the retrospective study. And in these three, three groups of patients, except for the duration of the eye disease, we did not have any difference in the uptake of technician, which was the tracer used before the treatment with, with the ablative dose of radioiodine. We did not have differences at serum levels of TSA receptor antibody. There was no difference in the prevalence of pre-existing orbitopathy, which was about present in about 80% of patients. So we did include in the study also patients with no previous eye signs. And also, sorry, and as, as, you, as you see in the second part of this table, when we looked at the patient with pre-existing uh, orbitopathy, we see that the, the prevalence of a smoker between the patient undergoing uh, prophylaxis and the, and the uh, sorry, the patient with pre-existing GO and the patient without GO, there was no difference in the prevalence of smoking, no difference in the levels of TSA receptor antibodies and the positivity, uh, positive test for TSA receptor antibody. And there was uh, no difference in the clinical activity score because here there was none, no, no GO, but here it was very low because all patients had inactive disease. So when we um, uh, uh, analyzed the data of this study, there were two points that were very interesting that we wanted to find to, to confirm. One was the fact that there was a, an association between the activation of disease and the prophylaxis in the way based on the difference of the duration of disease. And as you see here, we at six months, which was the end of the study and the beginning of the follow-up, the end of the study for six months, we did not have a, any activation in either patients undergoing intravenous or oral steroids. And we only had one transient activation in one patient not uh, submitted to steroid prophylaxis. And, and, and this patient developed transient activation, uh, inflammation of of the orbit while uh, because she missed the follow-up visit and uh, when she came back three months after her TSH was 80 so she was definitely uncompensated uh, she definitely had uncompensated hyperthyroidism for three months we also wanted to look though at a longer follow-up because uh, particularly based on studies published uh, by Trisk at all they they looked at the uh, the prevalence of reactivation in patients with smoking and their, uh, with, uh, who were smokers, and this follow-up was longer than, than, uh, than one year. So we followed up patients for more than two months, actually up to five years. And uh, in fact, we only observed two patients, one in the group of IV steroids and one in the group of oral steroids, who develop optic neuropathy, and one developed it 12 months and one 20 months after the end of the study. So we don't think that this was uh, actually related to the uh, radioactive therapy, but was probably due to a, a natural uh, react to the activation of disease due to the natural course of disease as we often see. And uh, in none of the patients uh, of this study, we had, uh, we observed de novo occurrence of orbitopathy. Then we also studied other parameters that may, might have been in relationship with the radioactive outcome. And the only interesting finding was that patients who were actually responding the most to uh, radioactive iodine were the ones who had smaller thyroids, smaller thyroid volume. There, were, there was no other parameter correlating to the responses. As you see, the response was about 80% uh, overall in these patients. One interesting point is that in the prospective study, we all also wanted to look at the um, variation, the changes of the uh, serum TSA receptor antibody levels, because as, uh, as uh, you probably all know, 
you know, the radioactive iodine, after radioactive iodine, uh, there is a surge in these uh, um, antibodies, in the levels of these antibodies, and I'm sure that Dr. Davis will explain in detail this later on. And so we wanted to see if this, this surge, which is well known and well documented, is affected by the uh, steroid prophylaxis. And interestingly enough, when we compare the three groups, we observed that at 180 days after the uh, therapy, the levels of TSA receptor antibodies were the same in all three groups. But interestingly enough, there was a blunted peak of these uh, uh, antibodies at 45 days after radioactive iodine in the two groups in which steroids were administered. And whereas the patient not receiving steroids uh, did not have uh, actually peak at 45 days and, and, and maintain these levels up until 90 and 180 days subsequently. So we, this is not a proof that this surge is the cause of reactivation of eye disease, but we think that it's nicely related. This, as this is a nice explanation for an effect that that radio, sorry, that steroid prophylaxis may have in favoring the the, the protection against TSA against the reactivation of, of the eye disease uh, when you ad, when, when one administers radioactive iodine. This study was also reviewed recently in clinical thyroidologists, uh, making all the observation. And I would just stop here uh, because I'm afraid that with the, the, pro the technical problem we had at the beginning, I may have gone over time. Uh, you, uh, you're, if you have further comments, Dr. Salvi, you're, you're more than uh, able to uh, finish up here if you um, we're not under significant time pressure at the moment here. It's up to you. Well, I, you know, unfortunately, I don't know how much of the first part was was really uh, understood and followed because of the technical problem of seeing the slides. So maybe I will leave this maybe in the in the question time if there is anything to be clarified so that we can go specifically to the point if there's something there that is not clear. Unless, unless you have a question or, 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 or Dr. Davis has one right now. Well, I think we'll turn over the, um, the microphone to Dr. Davies and then we'll open this up for questions at the end here. I just okay. encourage all of our attendees to, um, to write in their questions um, uh, and uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible at the end. Well, thank you, Mario. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Is my screen visible? Yes. So, so I'm going to review um, a little bit on the causes of Graves and eye disease and support Mario's elegant work uh, and discussion. And just remind you that, at least from where I sit, right now in the basement, but normally. Um, I sit outside in the world. We, we look at uh, Graves and Hashimoto's as very much similar diseases. Uh, and there's a spectrum. In fact, it's not unusual for patients with Hashimoto's to develop Graves' disease. It's not unusual for um, Hashimo uh, Graves' patients <coughs> to develop Hashimoto's. It's quite common. What people do often forget is that you can develop what we call Graves' eye disease, or much better to call it Graves' orbitopathy. It is an inflammation of the orbit. It's not eye disease. The eye is fine, mostly, um, but it's an orbitopathy. Right? Uh, but that occurs also in some patients with Hashimoto's, which just drums home the fact that not only are these diseases both in the same families, um, but you can also present with a similar clinical phenotype. Let me go to the next one. Now, this first slide is taken from that primer that I was lucky enough to uh, be joined in uh, a series of international colleagues, um, and which I, if you're interested in Graves' disease at all, I, I, like Mark said at the beginning, I think it's a great review of the disease, and it's just come out and, uh, uh, under the title Nature Primers. 
it has almost everything I'm going to say this morning, um, apart from a few nuances. Uh, this slide is taken from, from that review, just to remind you about the pathogenesis of Graves' disease. It is, of course, caused primarily by the secretion of stimulating antibodies, unique human antibodies not seen in the animal kingdom. Um, and these antibodies uh, presumably are generated by a mixture of genetic and environmental factors, which is what we always say. In fact, we don't really know, right? But we fail to tolerate the TSH receptor and develop not just antibodies, but also T cells. And the antibodies uh, to the TSH receptor have this unique um, stimulating uh, effect on the thyroid gland. And you can see in this uh, diagram that the uh, <coughs> antigen presenting cells at the bottom, uh, on, the, on the left at the bottom, um, present uh, thyroid antigen um, to the immune system, to T cells, and <coughs> also to B cells. Um, uh, and, and, and this initiates an immune response. Now, it's not just the T cells and the antibodies alone that are acting in Gray's disease, but we've known um, about the antibodies since the, the description of autoimmunity in Gray's disease by Duncan Adams in the 50s. Um, we've known that eye disease occurs in the presence of high levels of TSH receptor. Um, but there's another factor <coughs> that, excuse me, that people forgot about um, for many years, and that is that TSH and the antibody, the stimulating antibody, um, work together with IGF-1, um, and they are they they are synergistic. IGF-1 is there in everybody in the serum; it's a growth factor, right? And it it uh, uh, synergizes with the action of TSH, so that known for many years that TSH is much more effective at stimulating thyroid cells in the presence of IGF-1 um, and similarly with the antibody. So, let's go to the <clears throat> so in addition to the stimulating antibody on the left, shown here binding to the ectodomain of the TSH receptor, what are called the leucine-rich repeats, right? The stimulating antibody sits there just like TSH and is able to initiate a normal signal. But there are also antibodies that sit on the receptor and don't fit quite so well, and they actually block TSH action. And there have been a number of reports of hypothyroidism associated with such antibodies that I think really just confuse, confuse the issue. Um, most patients have both these types of antibodies. There's a, a, a gradation from stimulating to blocking uh, and a uh, different potency. Uh, and, and both of these can be measured simply in a commercially available receptor antibody assay. The bioassays, you have to be careful as a clinician in the United States as to what lab, uh, uh, what the lab is selling you because a bioassay involves testing against a thyroid cell and looking for a response. And in that one, you'll only get the stimulating activity. But there is a, uh, uh, I shouldn't mention any names, but there is an assay widely used by one of the largest labs in the country that claims to measure stimulating antibodies. It is in fact a receptor assay. Which is quite they call it a TSI assay. There's a third group called the neutral antibodies that, in fact, are not neutral at all. They bind to the TSH receptor, but not in the TSH binding region. They bind to the part of the receptor that links it to the cell membrane. Those are called neutral or hinge region antibodies. Those antibodies, which we don't have time to talk about today, <clears throat> actually can um, initiate abnormal signals that end up um, compromising the cell or even killing. So, um, Mario's group um, have been very active in, in helping clarify 
a clinical approach to orbitopathy. I think it's still pretty confusing, Mario, but, but it's better than it was. Um, this, I think, is very helpful, and that is, rather than going through these complicated um, clinical activity scores that nobody uses except in research or, or pretends to use, um, it's much better to define a patient as having mild, moderate, or severe disease. And this is the European definition uh, definitions of mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, and basically, most patients have very little eye disease. Depends how hard you look. Um, um, and and, and you know, a significant number have mild disease. Um, this can be very distressful, of course, particularly to young um, patients uh, when they look in the mirror and one eye is slightly different to the other. Um, but generally, when it's a very, very mild disease with only a small degree of proptosis um, and really uh, 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 some tearing and, and not much inflammation or swelling, um, there isn't much to do except to reassure the patient, uh, give them artificial tears and tell them you hope that this is going to settle down and not deteriorate. You're right. Moderate disease is the disease that we don't like, right? And eye disease has one particular characteristic, at least in my uh, experience, and that is moderate eye disease is extremely frightening to the physician. If you don't see eye disease very often, and your patient walks in with tearing eyes and proptosis, um, many physicians start to quiver, right? And that's not what you should do. You should remain calm, and collected, and get advice. But moderate disease generally will need some treatment. And that's what uh, we're currently talking about. Um, severe disease is uh, extremely unusual. But obviously, in a center like Mario Salvi's, they're going to see it regularly. And this really require severe, either instant immunosuppression or instant um, surgery. So most, uh, most people who don't see a lot of eye disease, this sort of figure can be helpful. Um, so A, C, and E are basically mild, moderate, and severe. So the mild eye disease, the A on the left, um, you will see quite commonly. Right? There's a little bit of lid retraction, maybe some tearing and mild proptosis. When you look at a uh, MRI or a CT, you can see the muscle bellies are uh, really not very large. So this one, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but uh, the one on the left eye, uh, you'll see some enlargement of the lateral rectus stuff. Uh, for the moderate disease, you're starting to see diplopia quite commonly. So here you see on the left, uh, there is significant proptosis. It's always hard to see proptosis in photographs, 2D photographs. Um, but one of the worst characteristics uh, of eye disease, and one we can prevent the least um, so far, you know, maybe looking better, um, is the fibrosis. Uh, and we'll come to that. But the fibrosis of the muscle bellies um, cause diplopia. And that is obviously the most distressing part of the disease, far worse than the, um, the look in the mirror. And usually in those patients, the muscle bellies are much larger. And so for the severe disease, where there's marked inflammation and proptosis and diplopia and even um, retinal danger, shown on the right, um, which you can sometimes see by the muscle bellies crowding the retinal artery, uh, the, uh, uh, arteries, um, and causing um, distress to the retina. So this can be a very severe disease, which is why people are very interested in it. Luckily, it's rare. I have the feeling it's becoming more rare because we're treating Graves' disease very early, but I've got no scientific data to see that. Now, the next, the next thing that's commonly thought is that the Graves' eye disease is a slightly different disease and therefore must have different genetics. You see this all the time, even from thyroidologists, even from Italian thyroidologists. 
that that Gray's eye disease is a different disease. It has different genes. People inherit it in a different way. Um, this is an unpublished GWAS. We have to publish it at some point. But on 400 patients from the Mayo Clinic, all of whom went for surgery to their eye eye disease. So they all have significant Graves orbitopathy. No one's going to doubt the diagnosis. And there's really no um, no new genes associated with Graves' eye disease that have not previously been recognized as associated with Graves' disease in general. The large association here uh, uh, in, in the middle on chromosome 6 is, of course, HLA. And HLA is the strongest <coughs> and most important association with Graves' disease and Graves' eye disease. And there's really no difference. I think I have another that point because it's one of my hobby horses. So he is looking at HLA DR3, which you often see as the most associated HLA. Um, what there is in families. Um, but you'll see that the patients who are DR3 plus and minus are with Graves' disease, with Graves' orthopathy, with no Graves' orthopathy, um, are really no different. There's no difference in the prevalence of, of, of DR3 in any of them. It is, of course, more common than in the control population. Um, uh, but that doesn't help us very much uh, as far as Graves' eye disease is concerned. So far to date, despite multiple papers claiming genetic associations with eye disease, there is nothing confirmed. So what about the pathogenesis of Graves' eye disease? Uh, this slide just summarizes everything. And let's start in the middle in the retroorbital fibroblast. For a very strange reason that we should have known for 50 or more years, maybe 70 years, <clears throat> the fibroblast um, has a TSH receptor. Right at the beginning, when the stimulating antibody was discovered, it was discovered in patients with what are called the Graves triad the eye, the skin, and the thyroid disease. And so we should have immediately realized that the stimulating antibody must be affecting the eye, the thyroid, and the skin. But somehow we got totally focused on the thyroid gland for 50 years. And it's really only in the last 20, 25 years that people have realized that the TSH receptor is expressed elsewhere, outside the thyroid. In fact, it's expressed in multiple places. It's particularly well expressed in the retroorbital fibroblasts. And that's sitting in the middle as the primary um, a primary culprit in this story. So <clears throat> the orbital fibroblast clearly responds well to growth factors, including IgG. And it expresses the TSH receptor. So it's able to synergize with TSH, which is at all levels. There's a tear thyroid stimulating antibody, then it responds very well to this uh, antibody. And the result is that fibroblasts can uh, differentiate into either myofibroblasts or adip adipocytes. Now, the adipocytes will grow quite considerably. In fact, some patients have a lot of fat behind the eye, and you could argue that it's one of the uh, one of the um, um, promoters of proptosis. <clears throat> and the myofibroblasts, which are in the muscle cells, in the muscles, also uh, are going to respond and grow and secrete um, hyaluronic acid, which, as many people know, provides a high osmotic pressure. So fluid um, goes into the muscles and disrupts the fibers. And so you get muscle damage followed by fibrosis, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the most um, terrible side effect of, of what, one of the worst side effects of the disease. Now, the fat cells don't contribute much to fibrosis. They do contribute not to the already swollen muscles uh, and contribute to fibrosis. 
Um, Terry Smith has uh, uh, also suggested that there are fibrocytes in the circulation that come in from the bone marrow into the eye, and that's an area that still needs to be clarified. And maybe Terry will know more about that than I do, but I haven't seen much clarification of those observations. Now, while all this is going on, there's inflammation. Right? Inflammation caused by the T cells and the B and the antibody, but primarily the T cells are attacking um, the receptor also on the fibroblasts, and setting up a lot of uh, local inflammatory responses, which are contributing to all this uh, activity. And I think we have a good handle on what's going on right now behind the eye, much better than we used. Um, ra rather than just referring all the time to Dr. Salvi's work, took a few slides from other, other investigators just to prove that he's right, uh, generally. Um, and this is a nice, uh, one of a few, I think, meta-analysis of the role of steroids in, in treating eye disease. It's a little complicated, but um, the risk ratio is shown on the right. right. So in this sort of slide, to the right favors the treatment. And you'll see that if you look at intravenous glucocorticoids versus nothing, right, a control of placebo um, in, in Gray's eye disease, that generally it's a very significant improvement. So steroids can be highly effective in a good proportion of patients um, with bad eye disease. No one's going to be arguing about that. However, there's not a big difference between intravenous and oral. Um, I know the Europeans love the oral, um, the intravenous. And it's a little more difficult over here in the States to use. Um, you need to use generally an infusion center. Um, but there is a, 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 a clear benefit from using intravenous. Uh, the side effects have been claimed to be much less from intravenous than oral. A lot of that depends on dosing. Um, here, you'll see that there's intravenous glucocorticoids plus oral. This is just oral. Um, oh, this is radiation. I think OR is radiation. Again, a little bit of improvement. Here's rituximab, right? A B cell um, uh, suppressor, immunosuppressant, um, that um, is not terribly effective in, in these particular studies, although other people have found it. Uh, this is. Uh, I think we'll come. We'll come back to these. Come back to it. Uh, uh, this other surgery. One at the bottom is surgery. Well, obviously, surgery is highly effective in the hands of a good surgeon, of a surgeon who knows what he's doing with his eyes. All right. So here's some. I think this is Scandinavian data. I seem to have lost the. the uh, um, this looks at time after. Uh, uh, with development or worsening of orbitopathy following radioactive iodine treatment. And you'll see that in A, right, uh, as Dr. Salvi pointed out, generally radioactive iodine causes more problems with the eyes than medical therapy, generally. But the degree and the amount varies from study to study, how many patients, how long they are. But I want you to look at the other ones. The one to the right is just smokers. Smokers versus non-smokers. Why smoking causes eye disease to be worse is unclear. Um, whether it's just smoke that gets in your eyes, whether it's something to do with nicotine or, or in the circulation affecting the immune response, we don't really know. C is giving radioiodine just to non-smokers. So clearly there is a radioiodine effect without smoking. And B, uh, D is the smokers data, where they really do badly, right? Smokers do badly in general, uh, somewhat worse with radioiodine, but they've got to stop smoking. Got to stop them smoking. So why do the eyes deteriorate after radioiodine? Well, 
When I was a fellow, I worked with a, another fellow called Alan McGregor uh, in the hall, in the lab of uh, Reginald Hall, late Reginald Hall, and um, Bernard Reese Smith, who's still very active in the field. And, and Alan found very clear data that there was a surge of radioactive uh, of, of TSH receptor antibody after radioiodine treatment. That's been um, confirmed uh, for many years. Right? So we're talking now about 40 years ago. Uh, and at the same time, he, lo he looked for a mechanism of why this is going on. And working with Sandra McLaughlin, who's also done a lot of work in this field. Well, actually, this is not. This is, this is data from the late Peter Lauber, just to make the point and show you and illustrate the increase here in radioiodine induced uh, receptor antibody. You see a surge, right, at six months in the receptor antibody titers only seen after radioactive iodine. Now, the other thing that uh, Peter, the late Peter Lauber, brought out beautifully in this slide. I recommend to every clinician is that while radioiodine not only increased the level of receptor antibody after treatment, that antibody level doesn't go away very quickly. Look at five years later, these patients still have the antibody. In great contrast, huge contrast, particularly to surgery, right, but also to antithyroid drug therapy. In fact, in my experience, the surgical clearance of the antibody is much more dramatic. Than this. I see patients with the antibody disappearing within six months. Um, and that's another discussion that we could have another time. The point here is that radioiodine causes this big induction of TSH receptor antibodies. And since we've known for 70 years that these antibodies cause eye disease, although people still cogitate on it, um, it's clear that you're going to get a bad response. And this rather poor slide, it's very old, and I wasn't able to get it out of the lancet um, uh, easily, but this just shows that the in vitro studies done at that time in the 79, to look at the influence of irradiated lymphocytes on a patient's antibody response. This is done with microsomal antibody in this patient, and then with thyroglobulin antibody in the second and the third uh, patient. And you'll see that each time they got to a particular irradiation dose, and added the lymphocytes, irradiated the lymphocytes back, they got an increase in thyroid antibody release uh, in vitro, right? Uh, documenting that irradiation has a direct effect the immune response. And this is primarily helper T cells that are very susceptible to irradiation. And once you irradiate the lymphocytes, you activate, you, know, you inactivate the helper T cells. No, rather, you inactivate the regulatory T cells and allow the helper T cells to So I think we have a mechanism. We have clear data on multiple studies that there's an increase in, in the disease causing TSH receptor antibodies. So why would anybody want to use radioiodine? Well, people do. Um, and I suppose it was Bartolana first, Mario. I'm not sure who was the first in the literature, um, but, but certainly one of the Italian groups and were the first to show uh, inhibition of the effect of radioiodine. In the sense of group one, got this radioactive iodine and developed worsening of thermopathy. Uh, and group two got, I think at this time, oral corticosteroids and didn't, didn't um, develop um, orbitopathy of radioiodine. Maybe it was intravenous. Um, but the point being, that if you give patients a steroid dose at the time of radioiodine action, um, it's going to help. And this is the slide that you saw earlier. It's not as nice a slide as Mario's original. 
But the point is that his group were the first to actually document that the antibody rise is prevented by corticosteroids. And that was shown at here yeah, at 45 days, that group A, uh, 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 group um, C, I should say, who got no steroids, got this surge in antibodies at, at, at 45 days, it was not seen in the oral and intravenous groups, right? And and I think that is important. It simply just um, uh, supports my approach, which is not generally to use radio ID, but if you have to, giving steroid suppression. Um, um, so lastly, um, this is the last slide. Um, where are we with treatment of Graves' disease, uh, uh, Graves' eye disease, right? So if we um, find the patient with the eye disease or we cause it with radioiodine, what are we going to do? Well, there is a rash of treatments becoming available. It's amazing. Um, people have finally decided that eye disease is important. In the pharmaceutical industry has caught on that this is a rare disease and can avoid a lot of... Uh, developmental problems um, for, in the States at least. And there are a whole rash of different antibodies. You know, this is not a place to talk about them today. But you, every time you open the journals at the moment, you see advertisements for Tabiza, um, which is a monoclonal antibody that blocks the IGF-1 receptor. And as you've heard, that will therefore stop synergizing with the antibody, the stimulating antibody, uh, and harm the disease and results uh, Michael phenylate, which is um, certainly being used well in, in China, where they one group claimed almost total uh, suppression of eye disease. Um, it has not been everybody's experience, but clearly it's a very commonly used drug in renal transplantation uh, and uh, has very few side effects, easily available um, for everyone to use. And I have used it a couple of times with quite good effect. And I'd be interested to hear from Mario. There are a series of other antibodies coming on, online. There's a clinical trial in TSH receptor antibody blocking, blocking antibody monoclonal. There's a new one, um, not listed even here, um, that it affects uh, the lifespan of IgG uh, that is almost like a, a, a intravenous um, um, removal. Of, of the antibody. Within a few weeks, antibody levels go dramatically by removing the FC receptors. So uh, I just want to leave you with the idea that this is a serious disease. We know uh, an increasing amount about it, and the treatment is becoming easier. We have to get away from steroids, which are horrible drugs, as everybody knows. And that's my. Thank you. So then we have to go back to the case. And you can tell that I didn't write this case because this guy is being offered radio iodine. And uh, we have to go and answer the questions again. Whoops, I don't want to bias you in any way towards what is the right answer. So poll is open, it says here. So, Mario, while we're waiting for the final response here, um, I, it doesn't quite look like we had as dramatic an impact here on the um, on the answer uh, to this question. But um, nonetheless, I want to give you an opportunity to comment on uh, Dr. Davies' outstanding presentation before I um, pose some additional questions to you. Uh, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond here. Yeah, I just sh saw the slide very briefly. I'm not sure I could read it well. No, do you have uh, Do you have any responses to Dr. Davies' presentation here? Uh, okay. Well, no. I think it's pretty pretty. Terry Davies has really gi uh, given a, a very comprehensive overview of everything, including also the very very latest. Uh, 
uh, news about emerging therapies which are really as you said making it easier to treat this disease um, the only comment I wanted to make, and I, and I appreciate it very much, that, uh, that, this, that the slide that he showed from the study of Lauerberg with the big increase of TSS receptor antibodies after radio iodine, which we believe we can some way control if we give a steroid uh, at, uh, at the time of treatment. And this confirms uh, the, the studies of Bartalena in the late 80s. Uh, just one comment that I want to make um, is that uh, it is true that in a, in a survey we ran through the UGOGO community, it seems that the, uh, the, the very severe orbitopathy, the optic neuropathy, is decreasing as we are managing better patients before. Okay, so when the disease is not as severe. I think that this is what is, you know, we can see that in our clinics. What I observed, though, in, in my center, which I think is a little bit the, the mirror, is mirroring the, what we see in some specialized center of Gray's eye disease, is that though um, the number of optic neuropathy are better handled because we get them earlier, but there's no real a decrease of those. It is as if uh, the feeling that we have is that the uh, natural history of this disease progressing to optic neuropathy, no matter what you do, is not modifiable. And we've been observing optic neuropathy after any sort and any kind of therapy in all the clinical trials we've done. No matter if we treat the patient with steroids, if we give rituximab, if we give uh, um, belimubab, then we're trying, and all the other treatments. So I think that there's something that has, we're still missing about why the patient, to at some point, goes on to have this very severe complication, uh, despite the treatment that we we we, we really provide. So. Um, thank you. Um, I, I want to just ask, pose a few quick questions um, for some uh, quick responses here. It appears from your study, uh, Mario, that, that it's the time course of the rise in um, TSH receptor antibodies that is the key factor here because the absolute level um, ultimately rises um, uh, to, um, but in a delayed, but in a in a delayed way. And what is yeah. it? Um, that you speculate about the rapid surge that um, has this profound effect on the orbitopathy? Well, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, the, the first few slides that Terry Davis has shown about the, 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 the fact that, you know, we have exposure of antigens. I mean, when, when we uh, administer radioactive iodine, we break up the thyrocytes and all the antigens are exposed. And they and they become autoantigenic. That's, that's that's something that is well known. And it is possible that in a situation like that, and uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, cytokine milieu is modified in that situation, and we have a prevailing uh, certain uh, uh, inflammatory pathways that go on to uh, uh, I will say trigger more autoimmune. Uh, the, the autoimmune cascade, and in, it may well be that some of these patients do also switch from the uh, blocking or neutral autoantibodies to the stimulating autoantibodies due to that, because you know the 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 um, um, the the, the, uh, the, 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 bio, the, the biochemistry of it all changes in the sense that we may have an increase of the titer of these antibodies, and the titer of antibodies is definitely related to the kind of binding the antibody has. So we, we may display some blocking antibodies and, and, and have more stimulating antibodies coming up. I mean, these are all the possible hypotheses, but definitely radio iodine destroys the thyrocytes but leaves the uh, the consequences in the thyroid, which is now this is something that doesn't happen if you take the thyroid away by surgery, because that that you eliminate the possibility 
of, of having um, uh, autoantigen triggered for, the, for, for a longer time there. I don't know if I could I make myself very clear on this, but I think it's really related to the amount of antigen exposed that you have after a radio iodine, they may trigger the rise of these antibodies. Great. Um, in the time remaining, Mario, could you just comment, um, two of our questions from the attendees relate to the dose of corticosteroids and specifically what oral steroid regimen you use um, uh, in terms, uh, both in terms of the dose and the timing of pretreatment relative to administering radioactive iodine. Okay. We first, uh, first, as I answer to the second question, <clears throat> we do not pretreat patients. We administer steroids starting from 48 hours after the dosing of, uh, after administering radioactive iodine, because we've done some kinetic studies and this shows that the, 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 that's the best time to avoid that the steroid may, in a way, compromise the uptake of radioiodine within the thyroid gland. So we start 48 hours after the dose. And in terms of the dosing, we, I, we use now, based on our studies, we offer the patient to use either oral steroids and we give them prednisone or the intravenous steroid and we give them methylprednisolone. The total amount of steroids we give is 1.5 grams, which is distributed in IV, in the IV regimen, in four weekly infusion, two of 500 and two of 250 milligrams per week. So it's all, all of four weeks. And uh, the uh, amount of, uh, and, and that equals the oral regimen, which, which goes on for six to eight weeks, depending on how we start off. Usually we start off with 50 milligrams and we, we, we taper it down to 25 and, and then to, to 12 and then to five milligrams. And that lasts about six to eight weeks based on the compliance of the patient. Terrific. Um, I, I think we could uh, go on for quite some time um, following both of these outstanding presentations, but unfortunately we're up against um, the end of our session here. I want to thank uh, both um, Dr. Salvi and Dr. Davies for two outstanding presentations. Dr. Salvi, I hope that uh, we will be able to call upon you again in the future um, to join us, uh, but can't thank you enough for both of these uh, really extremely educational presentations. I thank all of our attendees um, for joining us this morning, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, next Friday, and um, just hope that everybody stays safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.